Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for another day to look in your word this morning, and we pray that you would uh, meet each of us where we're at right now. Yes, Lord, Lord. strengthen our, our walk with you. Help us better understand who you are, how much you love us, Lord, and uh, let, our put, let us put our full attention on you. Lord, trust you entirely, Lord, with all of our, all of our life. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles back to 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. In verse 12, where we saw Paul just finished saying that really it was um, the grace of God, he says, that he was who he was. And uh, we went over that in detail. Honestly, I think all of us can probably say the same thing. We, we're n- Here we are, but by the grace of God. You know, if it wasn't for God's grace, probably none of us would be sitting here. And so we're so grateful for his grace and grateful for, I'm grateful for Paul the Apostle being willing to say that, you know, he said in another passage that he was actually the chiefest amongst the sinners. He, like, he didn't ever go, oh, I was, a, you know, didn't need Jesus at all. I was a good guy or whatever, you know. He, he just called it like it was. He was actually persecuting the Christians, killing the Christians, and he says, and God showed him grace. Now, grace is what? Unmerited what? Favor. He didn't deserve it. Um, he deserved uh, to be zotzed, actually, for all of the hardship he caused the church in the early days. But God said, I got a better plan. Instead of, instead of killing him, I'm going to convert him. And, and oftentimes, I, I ended last week with, you know, if you have an enemy that's really annoying you, best thing you can do is pray that God just converts them. Put him onto our team. And then it, uh, the Lord will take care of sorting out all the stuff they did wrong. You know, with Paul, the Lord showed him, you're going to, I'll show you all you're going to suffer for my name. You cause a lot of suffering, buddy. That's what the Lord did with Paul. He said, you cause a lot of suffering. Now, I'm going to show you what you're going to suffer for my name's sake. And Paul, did Paul go, oh, that's too much. I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm going to quit because, you know, there's suffering involved. I'm not, no. How many of you knew when you signed up to be a Christian that there would be some suffering involved? Did anyone hear hear that in the message that, you know, we would have to follow our leader, Jesus, who they persecuted and they beat and they crucified and, you know, rejected? And yet Christians, they call me up and they go, Pastor, you're not going to believe it. I got rejected for my faith. I was at work and they said, oh, you're such a prudish Christian. You won't lie and cheat. You won't even steal a pencil from the, from the, you know, office till. What, what's wrong with you? And, and they're, they're giving me flack. I'm like, Praise the Lord. You know, the Bible says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for what? Righteousness. R- in other words, you're doing what's right. Now, some of you are getting persecuted because you're just a jerk. That doesn't count. Don't be going, I'm so persecuted for right. You, if you're being a jerk, you're just getting persecuted because you're a jerk. Just call it what it is. But if you're walking after the, am I allowed to say that? They're looking at me weird. I'm like, is that, that's really the truth. I mean, some Christians are jerks. And then they want to use Jesus as a shield to their jerkiness. (laughs) Just saying, after doing this for a while, I've been around, I'm like, you know, some of these Christians, they really need to quit being such jerks and quit being so harsh to other people and quit being, you know, agitating to people intentionally. There's some guys that do it on purpose. They're like, but I just like doing it. I like getting under people's skin. Well, you're being a jerk. And when you get persecuted for that, don't come crying to me. Oh, I'm persecuted. for No, you're persecuted because you're a jerk. Stop being a jerk. Start following the Lord. But when you're doing what's right, I want to kind of like give you the heads up. Sometimes you're going to be doing what's right. And the people in the world are going to hate you because to, to them, you're like a light that shines on their dark corners and, and shows, exposes what they're doing wrong just because of your example. And sometimes they're going to hate you. Now the scripture says, don't be surprised. And who was it that spoke those words? Don't be surprised when they hate you on my account. I'm giving you a hint. Who is it? Jesus. 
There will be times you will be actually hated by somebody for your faith because they're not walking in the light. And the Bible says there's no fellowship between darkness and light. Yet we get surprised. Oh, man, I got, re I got rejected at work. Or my own family. Any of you had your own family reject you because of your faith in the Lord and they're mad at you? Like, what are you, the goody two-shoes of the family now? Oh, you're, you're just trying to make us all look bad. And you're like, no, I'm just trying to like serve the Lord and it it convicts them don't worry when that happens just take comfort you will it, it's gonna happen happen to Paul but see Paul goes on and he says something now about the whole purpose of this Christian faith this the whole reality behind the I mean the, and I call this like pulling back the curtain and seeing the big picture what's really important is coming up now in this passage. Would you look with me now at the beginning of the paragraph that, that starts off at verse 12, where Paul says, Now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, well, how do, how do some amongst you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and somebody in the church at Corinth was saying, Oh, there's no such thing as resurrection from the dead. By the way, that's not a new teaching. In Jesus' day, there was a whole group. They had the Pharisees, they had the, the scribes, and they had the Sadducees. If you want to remember which one was the one that didn't believe in res resurrection, that the, they were sad, you see. Because they, if you don't believe in the resurrection, they also didn't believe in anything that, like ghosts or spirits, you know, like angels. They go, well, those things are invisible. Anything invisible, anything I can't see is not real. Do we have people like that today? Yeah. They, they say they're um, realists or something. No, you're not a realist. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Try gravity. Yeah, try gravity. Say, oh, I don't believe in it. It doesn't exist. I can't see gravity. I'll take you up on a high building and give you a little push, <laughs> introduce you to it. It still has power over you whether you like it or not. I mean, we invented parachutes for planes because of this stuff called gravity. You know, we, we do all these things to avoid the effects of this thing happening to us in, in, a, in a, you know, kind of speedy demise. We like going down slow or free falling, but we need the parachute to catch us at the end. But guys that tell me, well, it's invisible, I don't believe in it. Listen, I'm here to proclaim to you, I'm going to tell you about a living God who's invisible. But he's real. And just like gravity has power over you, so does he. And he sent his son to die for us. And he didn't just die. Remember we saw earlier in the chapter the, the three things that according to the scripture, Paul said, are of first importance. Now, you guys have heard this so many times by now, you better remember. What's the, what's the first thing of first importance? You can look, for those of you that weren't with us, you, you know, Kelly, you get to go to verse 3 and, and see. He says, the things, the three things of first importance about the gospel that come from the scripture. What was the first thing that Christ died for what our sins that's the first thing of the of the gospel if you leave this out of a gospel message you're not preaching the good news in fact you're preaching crummy news the first thing of the gospel is christ died for our sins what's the second thing he was what buried, buried. and the third thing he rose he was resurrected according to the scripture the scriptures proclaimed that the messiah would come he would die for our sins. He would be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. He would then be buried. And how many days would he be in the grave? Three days. And, and how do we know that that was a sign? Jonah. Remember Jesus said as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. He, he even explained where Hades was and where Abraham's bosom was. Because we know in Ephesians 4, it says, before he ascended, he first descended and proclaimed release to the captives. Anyone want out of here? And they went, yeah, let's get out of here, man. And, they, and then the door was open. I always tell the kids, that waiting room for all those souls that were waiting to go into heaven, until Christ came, the door wasn't open. You couldn't go in. See, according to the scripture, Jesus came and he died and he was buried. And those three days... Those three days, what he waited, he, he wasn't just laying in the, like this in the tomb. No. 
He left his body. That this we're, we're going to talk about this. When you die, does your spirit stay in this shell? Paul calls this thing a tent, by the way. But he also mentions in 2 Corinthians, we'll get to this in a while, but in 2 Corinthians he says, we get an upgrade. This tent that clothes my spirit is going to be swallowed up by a what? What, what am I moving into? What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I'm going, what's he say? I'm going to prepare a place for you, a mansion. Anyone here for upgrading to mansions this week? You know, you trade in this tent for a mansion. Like, we know, I, I always, this is one of my favorite parts. This is the part of the resurrection, guys. And the resurrection is not just Jesus rose from the dead, but we're going to see Paul is going to explain it to them. That they, some of them didn't believe in resurrection. He's like, whoa, you're most to be pitied. In fact, anyone who doesn't believe in the resurrection, let, let me show you what Paul says right here. It, it, it's as clear as could be. He says, listen, in verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ was raised. And if Christ, he says, has not been raised, well, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in also in vain. Moreover, get this, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your what? In your sins. This is a big deal. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're still stuck in sin. But listen to this. Don't worry. He says, he says, and it, it, he says, then those who have also fallen asleep, that means they died in Christ, have perished. And if, we, if we've hoped in Christ in this life only, well, then we are all men most to be pitied. But verse 20 says, but now. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first fruits of those who are asleep, those that have died already. For since by a man came death, it says by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made, what? Alive. But each, it says, to his own order. Christ is the first fruit, and after those, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and the Father, when he has abolished all rule, all authority, all power, for it says, for he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy, pay attention, this, this verse here, verse 26, the last enemy that is abolished by Christ is what? Death. Death. Now you guys that know the book of Revelation know that it says Jesus will take Hades and death and he will cast them into the everlasting lake of fire, Gehenna is the Greek word. It, it, we say, in English, we say hell. We weren't allowed to say that when I was a kid. We had to say H-E double toothpicks. Was it, I was at a Catholic school and they didn't let us say the word. Like, I, it's a real place. It's in the Bible. It says hell. And they're like, you can't say that. It's a curse word. It's not a curse word when you're using it in context. And guess what? That everlasting lake of fire is going to swallow up the waiting room that Jesus descended into, remember where that guy, the rich man was in torment saying, hey, can you send Lazarus to give me a drop of water? And Lazarus is up there in Abraham's bosom, all AC, comforted, you know, having a drink. And he's going, nope, can't send him over. There's a chasm fixed between us. We cannot, cannot do. Well, can you send him back from the dead? Remember that? I have five brothers. By the way, you should really learn that story in Luke 16 and 17 about the rich man and Lazarus because it answers so many questions people ask us about the next life. They ask me all the time. So when we get there, will we remember this life? Will we, re will we remember each other? Will we, will we remember how our lives were down here? Will we, you know, th th those are valid questions. And I tell them, refer to the words of Jesus. If anyone knows what happens after this life, it's Jesus. And he... In the Gospel of Luke, it's so cool because if, you, if you're not familiar with this, Luke up to this chapter always says things about the kingdom of heaven. Like the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who goes to sow the seed, right? And the seed, some falls on rocky soil, some on good soil, some on the hard ground, some on the, you know, weedy so, uh, ground. And, 
And it springs up and it details all the things that happen in parables. Until you get to this chapter and all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like a man. He says, now there was a certain rich man. And there was also a man, and his, he was a poor man, a beggar, who was lying at his gate. And he was, he was begging, just saying, oh, that I could even have the crumbs, the crumbs that fall. This is, by the way, if you want to know where it is, Luke 16, verse 19. He even describes how the rich man dressed, how he lived. You know, had all the fine clothes of the day, the purple and the, and the, and the, and the fine linen. And he, he had, it says, he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, and he joyously was living in splendor every day. Now, he doesn't say there was like a farmer who went to farm and sold some things. He said, no, there was a certain one. I wonder if we replay the tape. If the disciples were walking with Jesus down the street that day and, and they were going, hey, what happened, to the, what happened to that guy Lazarus? I wonder what, oh, he's gone, you know, died. I wonder what, I wonder what, what became of him. And oh, I, oh, yeah, I heard the rich guy that lived in that house died too. I wouldn't be surprised if the apostles were going, hey, I, I wonder what, and Jesus goes, um, let me answer your question. You know the certain guy that, and, and, and the guy that was by the gate, here's what happens after you die. Now, in this story, Jesus says that the rich guy is going, can you send me Lazarus? He's still got the rich man's attitude. I mean, even in the afterlife, he's still acting like he's rich. Problem is, he's down in Hades being tormented, and he's going, you know, I don't want to bother you, Father Abraham. You're kind of important. Which, by the way, begs to bring up a really interesting question. Will we know even people who lived in generations before us when we, when we go to heaven? Like, will you know about Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph in the Bible? Or maybe you wanted to meet Daniel from the Bible and the lion's den, you know. Will you be able to know those people when? Sure. And the cool thing is that Abraham answers this rich man and says, listen, in your, now pay attention to this because this is one of the questions always get asked. The people who have already crossed over to the next life, will they, are they clueless about our lives down here? The answer is no. It's like they can sit in the heavenly realm, which by the way, I don't believe is far away. I think our eyes are just blinded to the fact that it's right around us. And we're just, we're just like Jesus, when he was resurrected, he was walking with the disciples on the road. And they're going, oh, this is terrible. We, we thought he was going to be like take over and everything. And then those women upset us today. They said that they went to the tomb. He's not there. And, 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 and they said some angels said he's risen. And, we don't, and they didn't even get it. And Jesus is walking with them going, now I had a question for you. When you get this new body, this heavenly body, does it have like a cloaking device on it? Those of you that watch, you know, Star Trek, you know what I'm talking about, the Klingons could cloak their vessel. Jesus was walking right next to them and it says they didn't, they didn't even perceive it was him. And I love it. Jesus just plays stupid. What things happened to this guy? Like he didn't know. They beat him up. They, they crucified him for our sins. They, they, they flogged him. They put him on a cross. And he's going, what things? And that's when he began to teach them all that he would do. The, the Messiah would suffer. for He would take on, on himself our chastisement. The chast, the, the, Isaiah says, the chastening, the chastisement for our peace, our well-being, fell on who? on Jesus, the Messiah. And he paid for it. And he just starts teaching them. Well, that's what the scripture says is going to happen. And they don't even know it's him until they get to the house. And he does one thing. What did he do? He blessed the bread and he broke it. And then where did he, what happened? So one thing, pay attention. What happens to you? Now, this is, why, uh, this is today's message. When you upgrade from this earthly tent to one of them heavenly mansions. Let me tell you, they got cloaking power. And they also got this other cool feature. You can be in the room and vanish. 
Like, literally, he vanishes from their sight. They run all the way back to Jerusalem and go, the Lord is risen, the Lord is risen. And I mentioned, you know, because some of the folks didn't catch that Simon Peter was one of those two fellas. And they saw it, they were like, wow, you, it was right there. I just, I never spotted it. The Lord showed himself to Peter, resurrected. And he's like, <gasps> and yet he vanished. And I think, does anyone here think this is going to be cool to have a body that you could like show up and then you could vanish? How many believe angels have shown up in your life at some point and then vanished? You know, just looking out for you or, you know, little things that the Lord, I, I go, you know, I'm pretty sure in the last, it's only a couple weeks from now, Jan and I get to celebrate 26 years of serving the Lord here in Kona. That we came to plant the church. 26 years of Sunday services is coming up for us. And I, I can tell I don't text very much because I was scrolling back through my text looking for something. And, um, and I had sent out a text a year ago. And I, I'm so creative. I type it once and then copy and paste <laughs> So I copied and pasted to all of the gang, you know, hey guys, don't forget this year is 25 years. That's a pretty big milestone, 25 years of ministering here. And, uh, and so I copied and pasted, copied and pasted. And I was like, I was looking for one person's name to send him a, a note uh, uh, for Auntie Dot. Now, by the way, we need to pray for Auntie Dot because she went to the hospital this week. And uh, now she's in bed rest and has to have her legs up and she's not doing well. So please keep her in your prayers. I was so psyched to have her here with us last week for Father's Day and to see John Robert and you know that was like big deal so but when when I think we're almost at 26 years and how many times has the Lord had to bring the groceries to us I mean it, you guys nobody wants to be in a position where you need God to send groceries okay they all want just to have enough in the bank that they buy their groceries but some people say to me, well if God did what he does for you for me then I would know he's really there. And I'm like, well, all you have to do is get broke and you'll see the Lord. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the Lord is really faithful. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't, they don't sow, you know, they don't plant, they don't, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father, there, oh, there's some birds right over there. See those birds? We got a visual aid. I'm a teacher. See the birds over there on the ground? Got little sparrows. We got one of them minor birds. None of them planted or, or reaped or did anything put into barns to store up. They didn't make savings accounts. And yet every day, our Heavenly Father feeds them. And what's he say about us? How much more value are you than these birds? Look at the birds. Every time you feel like, man, I don't know, Lord, if I'm going to make it, just look at the birds. God will make one fly by, I guarantee. He's so good at this. he make one fly right by you just to remind you, hey, I take care of them. I'll take care of you. And I've seen the Lord have angels pop. I'm pretty sure one guy was an angel that came to our door and handed me a check when we had we, we were so far in the hole. I was like, Lord, I, don't, I, I thought you said come here. You're, I'm trying to serve you. And the bills are piling up, and they're going to they're gonna turn it over to collections. I'm going to be such a great pastor, you know. And, and, and it, it's like, it's like ast to me, it's an astronomical number. And this guy comes to the door, knocks on the door, goes, are you Isidoro Manzo? I'm like, yes. And he hands me this envelope. I think I'm getting served. You know, those, um, those guys that give you the little thing, you're, you're now being sued. He hands me this sealed envelope. And I'm like, the, just to add to insult to injury, you know, it's like already been bad. Or maybe this is the notice that they're suing me for everything because I didn't pay or what. And I open the thing and I pull it out. And it's a cashier's check made out to me for ten thousand dollars now you guys that have been to my house you know that I have a very steep driveway <laughs> and um, or you have to go around the other side and he's standing right in front the guy handed me this check an older fella I'd never seen him before he just hands me the check and then I look down I pull it out I look up and he's gone now from my house it's on a hill so you can like, just look out, and there's really no way to get away from my house if you're going to try to sneak up on me. You know, we got dogs, and, and, and this guy had somehow come to the door without the dogs barking, and when I looked up, he was gone. He vanished. I went out to the edge of my wall, and I looked over. I looked all the way up and down the street. Where did he go? And it was like the Lord just went, you don't need to know. Look at the bird. The bird goes flying by. 
I'm like, oh, Lord, you always have to do that to me, you know? But is God good at taking care of us? You know, when, when I think, someone said, how do you know the Lord is real? I said, you just don't get it. He's been providing for us faithfully. And my wife was all concerned. Yesterday, she's taking these pumpkins that we had and cutting them. And those pumpkin, right? Those, those squash things. She's cutting them and baking them and scooping them. I'm going to make have to make some. The, the pastry lady who, who from Auntie's Angels that usually brings us stuff, she's a little bit low. She said she's not going to have anything this week. So she's going into overdrive, cooking and baking, and I'll just make some extra things so we can add for the pastry table and do all this stuff. And a couple hours later, we all of a sudden get a call. Oh, by the way, there was a few things left over. There was, what, like nine crates of stuff. <laughs> you know, literally big box of apples, you know, and, and, and bananas and all this stuff. And we're like, wow. And this morning when we set it out on the wall, we had so much stuff. And the homeless looked at me and said, listen, guys, this wasn't here yesterday afternoon. So you can give thanks to the Lord because the Lord brought all this stuff. I mean, even at noon yesterday, we didn't know what we were going to serve. And the Lord went, here you go. And by this morning, the truck was full. I mean, poor Alfred, his truck was packed with stuff to fill up to bring down here. And I just look and go, Lord, you, you keep doing this over and over. Is it hard for God to do things? We, we just make it like he's so far away, but he's not. He's right here involved in our lives. And sometimes I think we're just, we're like Peter was, blind to the fact Jesus is right there next to us, talking to us, instructing us, telling us stuff about him. And we're just like, I don't know where he is, man. It seems like he's not here. I got news for you. He's resurrected. So he's got ways to move that we're not thinking of. These glorified bodies, they got some cool features. You know, and, and I, want you to, I want you to know this part because apparently the church at Corinth needed to hear this. So I'm kind of guessing that most of us as Christians should hear the same thing. Let me turn you back now to, to um, well, Luke, he said, the rich man remembered his brothers. He remembered that, that he had good things. Abraham knew he had good things, and he said, you had your good things. Remember, you had your good things. But Lazarus didn't. But Lazarus is now being comforted. And he doesn't say it, but I'm inferring that he might have like given the hint, like, and you're getting what you deserve, you know, to that rich guy. So he says, send Lazarus back from the dead. If he won't listen, that, you know, just send Lazarus to them. If you can't send him over to me, please send him to warn my brothers. Now, what was, what was Abraham's answer? If they don't believe the prophet Moses and the prophets, then they're not going to believe if someone rises from the dead. Isn't that amazing? He says, Abraham answers. He says, they've got Moses and the prophets, same as you do. And if they don't believe them, even if someone rises from the dead, they ain't going to believe it. It's just the way it goes. So back to, to Corinthians, Paul says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. And he's the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep. Well, listen, Paul is explaining that Christ is going to put all things underneath his subjection, under his feet. And the last thing he'll put under his feet that he'll show his authority over is that one that has a wicked stinger that we read about. And what is that one? Death. And death is going to be wadded up in a little ball, I say, with Hades. It's kind of the combo. He puts them together in Revelation. He says death and Hades are going to be boiled up by the Lord and thrown into hell. Hades is not hell. Hades was the waiting room for going to hell. You don't want to be there, by the way. It's not even AC, nothing to drink. Don't think it's a good place. In fact, this is where the Catholics get the idea of purgatory. You know, from reading that story, they say that's, that's purgatory. That's a bad place. But they believe you can pray your way out or maybe have other people pray for you. And, or, or give some money for you, or get baptized for you. And even Paul's going to address that even back then. Guys, that's not a new teaching. Some of you might run into that in your course of your Christian faith. Someone going, well, but can you get out of there? I got a better idea. Don't even bother going. Don't stop off. Because when Paul talks in 2 Corinthians, he's going to tell us, when you're a believer, you believe in the Lord Jesus, you let him, 
what he did on the cross count for you, you accept that payment for on your behalf, then he says, when you die, you're then absent from your body. And where are you present? In Hades? No. In Abraham's bosom? No. With the Lord. I'd rather just tell you, skip those, that in-between stuff. Don't listen to those doctrines. Go go at what Jesus taught. Be, and, and Paul is, exp, you know, just regurgitating what Jesus made his understanding gain, that he would know, look, guys, the last thing Christ's going to do is he's going to abolish death. Now, this is pretty good. He said, death came from one man's sin, but life also came from one man. The first Adam brought the death. Jesus in, in Hebrews is called the second Adam, and he brings the life. And I'm so grateful for this. And it says, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now it says, when it says these things, all things are put in subjection, it is evident, it says, that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. This is Psalms. Psalms uh, 8, by the way, if you want to know. You can read it in the context there. Psalm 8, this is verse 6 of that psalm. And he says, and, and he, the one that is subjecting things, he's above it is what Paul's expressing. He says, And when all things are then subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the One, the One, or the Father, who has subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, <laughs> what would those who are baptized for the dead do? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? You know, they had the custom of being baptized for the dead in case somebody, you know, didn't hear. Let's get, let's get them covered. We'll get baptized. And by the way, there's still a group that does this today. They go and get baptized. Like a person steps in like a proxy for someone who died who they think, well, my uncle never heard about this. I better get baptized on his behalf. Now you're saying, that's cuckoo. Th doesn't the uncle have to do it? You know, doesn't it say you have to repent and be baptized? What if the uncle didn't repent? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if it counts. But the whole idea, Paul is saying, if the dead aren't even raised, why do they practice this practice? I mean, would they, you think, how foolish is this? I mean, some people think it's foolish because they're doing this on behalf of someone who's already dead. But think it through. If the dead aren't raised, it's really foolish. I mean, this, he's just going, excuse me, duh. I mean, this is the biblical duh right here. Duh. If the dead aren't raised, why do they even do that? And <laughs> some Christians are like, does that make it right? I'm like, no, he's just saying, duh. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you have to explain things in biblical terms, people don't get it. But if you use real vernacular, duh, I don't think this is, uh, pay attention to the point. The point is, if the dead aren't raised, duh, why are they doing that? They must, someone must know that the dead are raised. He, and then Paul says something very interesting. And why also, <laughs> if the dead aren't even raised, and Jesus didn't really rise, then why are we also in what? In danger. Now, was Paul ever in danger for the faith? Constant. Persecutions, threats on his life. Well, yeah, they actually, you know, beat him five times. With 40 save one, 39 lashes he received from the Romans for his being told, shut up, quit preaching this Jesus. You're upsetting our kingdom. You're saying there's another king, this invisible guy. He's dead and rose, and we don't like it. Beat that guy. If it wasn't real, he goes, well, why am I in danger if this isn't even real? Why are they so adamant to, to beat me and to stone me and, and, and to see me killed? He says, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, I die daily. If from human mo motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, well, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, then he quotes from Isaiah 22. Then let us eat and drink. Be merry. Tomorrow we what? We die. I mean, if the dead aren't raised, we shouldn't be sitting here on the beach going to church. We should just go party, right? I mean, if, if, if the dead are not raised, w would this be kind of foolish? But guess what? The dead are raised. 
So it's not foolish. So then Paul gives one. Of, and verse 33 is probably one of the best verses. I, I Maybe I should just, uh, I'll finish out this paragraph. There's only two more verses in this paragraph. He says, do not be deceived. Brethren, bad company corrupts what? Good character or good morals. <coughs> Some of you have good morals. But you get around people that have bad morals. And the bummer is, you think, well, I'm just going to help them become more moral. Is that how it goes? No, usually the one who's moral gets drugged down by the immoral. So Paul says, listen, just a little pointer here for this life. Don't be deceived. Do you think any of the Corinthians had a struggle with this? You know, that, that I've told you about the, the place of Corinth, right? It was the Las Vegas of the day. It was Sin City of the ancient world. And Paul is writing to the church and he's saying, look, the, the crux of our faith is Christ died for our sins. Were they around sinners? Yes. And what's he got to tell them? Don't be deceived. If you're going to hang out with, with bad company, it's going to drag you down. It's going to corrupt good morals. Today, do they teach that? I mean, any of you heard that message at all? In the TV shows that we watch? They actually, they actually heckle that idea. What, are you such a goody two-shoes you wouldn't hang out with us? You're too good for us? You know, and, and, and they make you like you're the bad guy for wanting to do life in a moral way. And being, you know, kind to people or being upright. Treating people like they're, they're of value. We had the, the Friday night, you know, family night. And we just had a couple of the folks there. It was mostly the young adults. So I got to tell them, look, in the dating world, I know this isn't taught today, but I got to tell you something. But the young ones, listen, you, you find someone, and I, I was t talking especially to the girls. Girls, don't get the idea that, well, this guy, he's got a few problems. He's a little, morally, his compass is a little crooked. But I'm going to fix him because I'm the good girl, you know. You know, the, the story like the good girl is attracted to the bad guy or vice versa, you know, the, the bad guy is attracted to, to the good. Listen, I'm just here to tell you Paul would say to you right now these words, don't be deceived. What's that mean? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Duh. Open your eyes. Bad company does what to good morals? Corrupts it. You are not going to fix the bad, immoral guy. This is not a missionary assignment from God for you good girls to go fix the bad guys. So don't even go there. Because if you try, I, I bet I could ask some of the aunties around here that maybe have what, some more life experience. Has, has it worked? Any of you that were willing to say? Does it work? I hear a lot of laughs. I'm pretty sure that means no. It does not work. Take it from them, okay? Better than that, take it from the scripture. Paul is speaking by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Don't be deceived. But do we get deceived? Why do you have to preach a message at church to the church? Like, can you get this, Joy? Can you get that? You have to actually preach to, to church goers that don't be deceived? I mean, what? They're in the light. They shouldn't be deceived. I submit to you, we need to hear this. This is an admonition for the church even today. Because we have a society, it's very similar to the Corinthian society back then. And it's shoving immoral standards in our face all day long. To where it's like, almost like people are like, well, that's just how it is in the world. Yes, that's how the world is. That doesn't mean, Jesus said you're in this world, but you're what? Not of it. I've used the example since I have the ocean behind me. There's a boat way over yonder. See that boat way, that little white speck out there? That's a boat. It's in the ocean. It is made to be in the ocean. It's okay. The only problem with that boat is not when it's in the water, it's what? When that water gets in that boat. 
You're made to be in this world like a boat, like a lifeboat. But if you let too much of the world into your boat, what's going to happen to you? You're going to sink. Don't be deceived. You let this world into you and it will corrupt you. And it will sink your boat. Spiritually, it's going to sink the ship. This is a, should I preach this at church? Like, I mean, is this like really like a real message that we should use today? Like, they needed it back then, but we don't need it today. Pastor, you just don't understand, you know, the new millennium. and We don't need that old stuff. Look, water still stinks ships. And junk in this world will still sink your Christian boat. It'll take you down. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And girls, don't go say, I'm going to just fix him. Please, I, I, if he can hear this, ask God to fix one for you and bring the one that's fixed. <laughs> Save a lot of headache. And by the way, guys, that goes for you too. Don't, don't say, I'm going to fix her. If he, if he doesn't do the things, you know, in the way that's godly and she doesn't do the things, don't think it's going to change. It's only the good Lord that can change. And Jesus said, you know they are my disciples by what? By the love, the fruit. If you don't see the fruit, now, you're not judging the person, but you are going to, I call it, you know, I heard, um, I think it was Greg Laurie said, we're not called to be judges of people, but we are fruit inspectors. <laughs> like, like if, if you're in the dating world, I want you to pay attention here. If the guy has no fruit of the Spirit, no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, super impatient guy, really harsh, no, not, not kind. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things as these, that's like a, that's not all of them. That's just like the idea. You know, you get the clue, right? These spiritual nice things. If he doesn't have some of that fruit in him, and you're going, I wonder if I should yoke my life to that person. If I should be joined with them for the rest of my life. Who you marry in this life, besides the decision to serve Christ, I believe who you spend this life with as a spouse is the second greatest decision you're going to make. The most, second most impactful decision on your entire life. It's going to affect every part of your life. Because if that person is not serving God and you're trying to, it's going to drag you down. Bad company will corrupt good morals. And missionary dating, I'm just here to tell you, if, if you want, I could have you give you my mom's number. She can give you life experience. She got married and divorced five times. She actually was the missionary dater at one point. That's her words, not my. I mean, she's telling, you know, she'll tell you today, not a good idea. Sometimes you gain wisdom by making mistakes, right? But the real fool is the one who won't acknowledge, yep, that was a mistake. If you made a mistake in life, it's okay. We can live from mistakes. I, I just heard this thing that, um, oh, this famous actor did this thing about Fail fast. You know, you're going to make mistakes. You fall down, but you got to get up and keep going. And you know what I like to do is I call it cheating. I don't like to make the mistake myself. I prefer to be a student of others' mistakes. This is called, it's my allergy to pain. I don't really like to pain myself. If someone else makes a mistake and I go, wow, they tripped on that. I think I'm going to walk around. Just note to self, I can learn from their broken toe. I mean, it's all purple and blue, and they stub their toe. I think I'm just going to pass on that. Any of you think that this is a good idea? I'm here to suggest to you, you could save yourself the spiritual pain, worse than stubbing your toe and breaking it. Worse, it it's, it's like a broken heart is what it is. You can save yourself a broken heart if you listen to these words and keep the water out of your boat. Keep this world out of your life. Don't let it come in and, and corrupt you because bad company will corrupt good morals. You need to hang with good company. And I hate seeing the, the, the younger generation. It's just being forced down their throat. When I was younger, they said, you were allowed to stand up and say, you know, I ain't going there. 
that's not really a good idea. They're like, well, you're judging us for saying that now. I'm not judging you. I'm just calling your sin, sin. And I don't want it getting on me. I don't want it getting into me. I don't want it in my vessel. I don't want it in my boat. Not good. I want to be a light to you. In fact, I'll be like a lifeboat that pulls up and says, hey, you're drowning. Did you know you need to get out of that water because you're going to go down? This world will take people down. Has anyone else agreed to this? This, is, this world is not user-friendly. It likes to use people up and just drown them and kick them to the curb. And that's not good news. The good news is Jesus says, I came to save the world. I didn't come to condemn the world. Not, not once has Jesus ever come off condemning. He always comes off and says, I came to save. Well, guys, let's take it to heart. I mean, this was taught to the Corinthian church. I'm pretty sure it still works today. Now, next week, I, I kind of hoped I'd be faster, but I'm not. That's, I'm sorry. Next week, I'm going to talk about that new body, a few more of the features, you know, besides the cloaking ability and the, and the vanishing ability and the reappearing. I got some more stuff for you. And, and I, I love this part so much because I don't think Christians actually like let just spend a little time savoring the idea of the the new heavenly body that awaits us. But Paul takes the whole rest of this chapter to to go into great detail about it. So if you have time, would you read for me from verse thirty five? Um, well, actually, oh, I didn't read verse thirty. I'll start at verse thirty four next week. I'll leave that for for next week. I, that's enough. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for the privilege we have to have your holy scriptures in our laps, Lord, on our devices, and we can look and see your words. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just see, but we have ability to see from your Holy Spirit what you want us to see today. Ears, like Jesus said, that would hear what your Holy Spirit is trying to speak to us. Let us be those people always able to hear your voice when you speak, Lord. And, and not just here, but let us be the ones that obey your voice. I think of Joseph in the Bible when you said, get up, take the baby Jesus and flee to Egypt. And he did that very night he rose and fled. And if he wouldn't have, Jesus wouldn't have, he'd been killed as a baby, but he obeyed. I want to be that kind of guy, Lord, that hears your voice and obeys. And I pray that everyone here, too, would share that heart, Lord, that we would want to hear you obey your lead. Do what you say. Help us, Lord, in these days. We ask it in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone who agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.